the Jones. Yeah. Yes. Indy, look. Oh, another lost episode, Shorty. Junior, some things are better off lost. Okay, let me start over. Are we starting again? Yes, we are. <laughs> <laughs> I am rolling. I am rolling as well. I myself cannot. Frankly, Dr. Lecter, that sounds more like something Miggs would say. Not anymore. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome to the Doonstief Audio Fiction Magazine. And now here's your host, Rish Outfield. Some men just want to watch the world burn. And Big Anklevich. What a douche. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Doonstief Audio Fiction Magazine. I'm Big Anklevich. And I'm Rish Outfield. Thanks. Oh, Big, it's been such a long time. Yes, it really has. I, I'm, I'm surprised that we're able to still get these old Zooms to work. What? I, what? Are you still there? Can you, can you hear me? No. I was just amazed that this ancient technology of our, our recording devices still works. Oh. Guess they don't make things like they used to, huh? Oh, no, not in ages. I, I haven't seen her. We had a falling out, I'm afraid. What? What? <laughs> I remember when you and I used to get together and podcast all the time. Yeah, those were the good days. How long ago would you say that were, that was, Biggie? Oh, I would say probably 60 years. Six. Wait, does 60. that sound right to you? Oh, it, it was 50 if it was a day. Wait, here it says 10 years. 10 years ago. we st That can't be right. Ten. Oh, it was 10. Okay. Why, why would we be talking in these ludicrous voices if it was only 10 years? Yeah, that would be silly. No one would do that. Yeah. That would just be ridiculous. So it couldn't be just 10 years. It's got to be longer. Well, let's do the math. When did we start the, uh, the, the, the Dougal Christmas podcast magazine stand uh, in the place where you live now face west? It was somewhere, somewhere a little bit after the turn of the century, I think. So what is that math up to, sir? Well, I think that was only I, uh, 18. I, I was... I, why, what? I was told there would be no math on this show. I, I'm not. I'm not really prepared. Uh, this says July 2008. We started. Two, oh, okay. Two, 2008. But that is only ten years. Oh. I think we ought to stop doing these voices. It's it's silly. We we beaten the horse to death, and you don't <laughs> look into the gift horse's mouth. You, you get right back on the horse. I don't have a dog in this yeah, race. You, but you don't change a horse midstream. That's right. But first, uh, <laughs> a stallion must be broken. Mm. Who's going to ride your wild horses? Oh, all the pretty horses, Wh in fact. Wild horses couldn't drag me there. No, and all the king's men and all the king's horses <laughs> couldn't put uh, this podcast oh, back together. Oh, wow. You think we'd beat a dead horse with the voices? <laughs> <clears throat> We completely killed the horse with the horse sayings. Well, a horse is a horse, of course. Of course. Of course. But I think <laughs> of all the horses of a different color. Yeah, if people didn't quit listening to our show. I mean, yes, this is 10 years and people have made it this far. If they haven't quit yet, they're definitely quitting now. <laughs> Well, and good for them. I mean, I'm surprised yes. it took this it's long. It's about yeah. time. I and mean, what have you been waiting for? Huh. <laughs> Welcome, everybody, to the Doonstief Audio Fiction Magazine. This is our 10th anniversary episode. Today we have a lovely story for you. And we have two lovely hosts. Unfortunately, they actually called and said they couldn't be here. So it's going to be just me and Rish. Yeah, sorry. And announcer man. Wait, really? 
And I am an outer man. I don't, I don't hear him. Why did I even show up today? Oh, yeah, really? I mean, this time we, we have to acknowledge that. Why? <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, the listeners are still here for no good reason. Why is announcer man still here? I thought he retired years ago. I, I thought we had retired years ago. <laughs> I'm pretty sure I went to announcer man's retirement party, though. Oh, was there cake? Yes, but then they escorted him to the door in handcuffs with a security guard, so... Oh, no. The cake kind of fell a little flat. But, you know, that's the way it always was for some reason. I could never understand that place. Oh, um, that's that's for later when we get the question. Sorry. We're not doing the questions today, though, are we? We're doing like them separate? It depends on how long this episode goes. The story itself is long. Do we want to talk people's ear off after the story? Should this be part one of a two-part 10th anniversary show? Yeah, I think it's going to have to be because the story is long. We have our special full cast post-show bit. What? And then whatever we have to say as well. So, you know, it's going to be a marathon as it is. Okay. So uh, we'll probably give people a break, including the editor of the episode. Yeah, that's a good point. But uh, yeah, and people didn't <laughs> want to hear us talk anyway. Pretty much. So that's why they stopped tuning in years ago. <laughs> yeah, why they came back, I don't know. It's one of those dogs... It's like no matter how badly you abuse that dog, there he is at your feet again. Well, every dog has his day. Oh, that's right. And uh, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. That's true. Dog gone it. And I don't have a dog in this race. <laughs> okay, today's story is by Josh Roseman. It is... Uh, Roseman. You remember Josh Roseman. He's the famous trombonist. No, 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 he's not to be confused with the famous trombonist. Sorry, I read that wrong on the email. Oh, okay. This is the other Josh Roseman, the famous writer. You know him. You're part of his fan club like we are. If you haven't heard Josh Roseman before, you should go back and listen to our archive because pretty much that's the only place you're going to get episodes of the Dune Steve anymore anyways. But yeah, check out his stuff. He's done a bunch of stories with us. He won one of our Broken Mirror contests with a story called 27 Jennifers. He's been on here a time or two. He's always got good, enjoyable stories for you. He's the guy that does the Secret Santa stories. That's right. A definite fan favorite. Check those out if you haven't. But you could wait till Christmas time, I guess, to check those out because they're kind of seasonal. Should we do like the about the author thing? Well, I think that's sort of what we're doing right now. Oh, but the announcer man didn't say it. Say it, announcer man. Gosh, you showed up here. About the author. All right, thanks. We're pretty much done with it, though. I, I guess I'll say that his his uh, website is roseplusman.com. And that's not the symbol plus. It's actually written out rose plus man. So don't be confused. Hmm. And you can check him out on Twitter at Listener42. Probably elsewhere as well. But that's as far as we're going to go. Okay, so uh, we got together more than a year ago on Skype mm -hmm. with a bunch of very patient volunteers to record what you're about to hear. <laughs> we had been sitting on the story for years, is it fair to say? Yes. <laughs> At that point. I mean, it's unfair to say that, really, because we were very unfair to Josh Roseman, but he was the patience of... Uh, there's a saying that goes with that, right? The patience of Job or something? What is, what is the saying? It's either dog or horse related. <laughs> but we wanted to do... There, there are so many characters and so much production that went into this episode that we're just like, you know, the, the only way we could do this is if we got a bunch of people in a room, like when we used to do the uh, New Media Expo get-togethers, and it looked likely that that would never happen. And so we got a bunch of people in a virtual room in Skype. We performed the story together that way. But uh, we knew it was going to be a pain to edit. Or rather, <laughs> I knew it was going to be a pain to edit. And I just kept postponing and kept postponing. And finally, your buddy, Justin Charles, he threw himself on this grenade. 
He saved a <laughs> bunch of very green soldiers, but also his commanding officer. And uh, and he was given a posthumous medal. So totally worth it. And, and yes, he, his mother was <laughs> presented with the medal and with his remains in the same little box. And I felt like that was kind of poetic. <laughs> That's I, right. <laughs> so big thanks right here to Justin Charles for doing this. Yes. If it weren't for Justin Charles, you'd still be waiting in 2019 to hear this story. Yes. <laughs> and thank you so much to Josh for being so patient with us. I, I'm sorry that it took this long. It was not right. Anyways, now that we've given it so much ado, should we not give it more further ado and just let him play the story? Yeah, let's go right ahead and play the story, and uh, we will be back uh, on the other side. I hope you will be too. Yay. Turn to Waypoint 5 by Josh Roseman. I never planned to come back to this station. I left here twelve cycles ago, as the Titin reckon things. About fifteen Earth years. No one uses Earth measurements anymore, except the ten families. Everyone else in the Confederacy is on the Titin system, which explains why I can convert the numbers in my head. The Titin call this place Waypoint 5. Most everyone here for the duration just calls it the station. It's equidistant, as far as such things can be measured, from the five major powers. Other than that, it has absolutely nothing with which to redeem itself. Almost. The station is symbolic. When the Titian formed the Confederacy, along with the other four, they planned at first to use Waypoint 5 as a seat of government. That lasted all of a half cycle, until some of the Karch got it under their scaly skins that destroying the place would end the Confederacy and put them in the navigator's seat. The Karch underestimated the Titine. So many people do. Once the Titine regrouped, they eliminated the Splinter Group and moved the Confederation Council to a more easily defensible location. Everyone knows where it is. But Waypoint 5 was rebuilt anyway. Now it's used for negotiation. Neutral ground, as it were. Energy weapons don't work here. The Titin see to it that disputes are settled fairly. At least, that's what the brochures say. There were enough different sizes of species in the Confederacy that I could dock my ship without an adapter. I was used to the scale of the place. It was the same anywhere the Supak were likely to be. Corridors three times my height, display panels that run vertically, everything labeled into tin common. I'm only an Earther, or so everyone thinks when they see me, but the Titin are scrupulously fair, and if I want to read the panels in Earthish, I can. I'm cosmopolitan enough to speak the five major languages, and more besides, Earthish isn't even available in my ship's computer. English is, but I rarely use it anymore either. Common is what I speak and read most often, and given what I do, it serves me well enough. I followed the signs to customs, where I declared my personal items, registered my ship, and submitted to a scan, just to make sure I wasn't carrying any energy weapons. The Canadoon, husky, red-furred, with drooping ears and a long muzzle, gave me an apologetic smile. I'm sorry, he said in common. Everyone has to. The words were mushy in his mouth, which was ill-formed to speak that language, but I understood. I've been here before, I told him in his native tongue. I know the drill. He slid my card across the table and flicked his right ear. A gesture of respect. Probably at my accent. Very good, Grey Cage. Kanedun always use full names. The family before the personal. You are cleared to enter. Welcome 
2.5. Enjoy the freedom to run, I said in Tatin. It's a Kanedun phrase, one I've always liked. He smiled, more or less his people's default expression, but I know Kanedun, and waved me through. I stepped off to the side as soon as I was in the station proper and ran my card through the reader in my comp. I felt myself starting to grin and controlled the urge. Maybe it was on purpose, or maybe the station needs an upgrade, but the clear steel blades in my sleeves didn't get registered. Customs got my sword, a relic of Earth from before the ten families left, and the various personal safety devices I'm never without when I'm off my ship. But now I had an advantage. I'd probably need it. After twelve cycles, most everyone I had known had rotated off the station or taken gainful employment elsewhere. Everyone except Kasana. I found her in her cabin, close to the engineering section, deep inside the core of the station. She opened the door and instantly shifted form, going from a relatively bipedal mass of crystal to the more detailed form she'd always taken with me. Hello, Kane. She subvocalized. Greetings! May I enter? Of course. Kasana moved aside and waved me past. Her cabin was bigger now, expansive enough to hold a world tree fragment instead of the standard bunk she'd slept in all those cycles ago. You're doing well, I said. You would know that if you had bothered to stay. Her voice, which I heard in the back of my mind, was accusatory. Or at least sent a communique. I'm sorry. I took the chair she offered. I've been busy. So you have. She leaned against the world tree, and I heard the wet jingling of her body changing to join with it. When she spoke again, I could almost hear the echoes of her voice as it resonated along the crystalline branches. Why are you here, Kate? I took out my comp, and, at her slight nod set it into the table-mounted cradle beside me. I got a message. From? Simone. As a rule, Kasana's people didn't have facial expressions, but she'd spent enough time with me to approximate a frown pretty well. What does she want? Here. Watch. I brought up the file and sent it to Kasana's wall screen. Dinah knows, said the recording. Simone was still as gorgeous as ever, bronze like a supak but with the finer bone structure of an earther. She found out you exist, and she tried to find you. I don't know where she is now, but investigating was always your thing, not mine. Simone sighed, <sighs> then pushed a lock of glossy black hair behind her left ear. Find your kid, then bring her back to me. You know the terms. The message ended, and the screen blinked off. Lovely person. I can see why you chose to leave her. Indeed. But she went and got herself pregnant. Are you certain the child is yours? DNA testing. I explained further, when Kasana's eyes unfocused, a sign she wasn't clear on the term. It's how my people's physical traits are determined. It's the same principle by which I know you're a four by examining your world tree. Yours is a strange species. This from a woman made of crystal who is impervious to heat and cold, but has to sleep in a tree. <laughs> well, we had a brief laugh over that. Kasana and I have been teasing each other about our respective species since we were part of the League together as raw recruits. But I didn't much feel like laughing. Look, I know you're an engineer. Chief of Dark Operations, thank you. Congratulations, then. But I want someone at my back for this. Kasana frowned. Why not hire? There are plenty who would take your money, and some who would work for you if you offered them passage. I know. You should see my message queue. But I don't trust them. Someone may have paid them more already. You? You, I trust. 
That is endearing. Impractical, but endearing. Please, Kasana, I said. I need your help. I heard the wet jingling again as she disconnected from the tree. She had no need for clothing. She had nothing to hide, and her species had no concept of modesty. But seeing her move toward me in that way was almost more intimate than anything I'd shared with Simone all those cycles ago. Kasana put her hands on my shoulders. Even through three layers of clothing, I could feel her create warmth in her skin. I missed you very much. The scent of hot glass and cinnamon made my mouth water, and my blood pump faster. Kasana and I had loved, and had been lovers, but we decided long ago we were just too incompatible. Of course, that was twenty cycles ago, before Simone. I remembered how to pleasure Kasana. If this was her price, I would pay it, and gladly. Rather than buy lodgings or face customs every day by staying on my ship, Kasana allowed me to fabricate a pallet to sleep on. Plus, her refresher was pristine. Being an unbreakable crystalline woman means just rinsing off the dust, and with a world tree for sustenance, she excreted nothing. I tried not to make too much of a mess. Kasana was back on her tree when I returned in the next rotation. Brazil? She's definitely here, I said. I slid my comp into the cradle and used the table to control it. This is security footage from five rotations ago. I should not ask how much you paid, should I? I smiled. What kind of security chief would I have been if I hadn't left myself a way back into the system? Not comforting. There was humor there. Watch, I said. On the screen, a tall, slender earther pushed back her hood and stared at an informational panel. She pressed a few keys, apparently looking for a language she knew. I paused the playback and dialed in a closer view. She looks somewhat like you. I made the affirmative gesture, then brought up one of Dinah's school holographs for comparison. This was captured a full cycle ago, as reckoned on Davalos. Davalos? Kasana's subvocalized tones were hard. Why was she on that world? Because Simone was apparently standing in the wrong queue when the deity handed out intelligence. Kasana and I had met in the space above Davalos, both very glad to escape that place. Simone works in one of the Karch establishments. An escort? No, nor a whore. She deals cards and runs dice games. I promised her to pay for Dinah's schooling if she promised to stay out of that line of work. She is not trustworthy. Not particularly, I agreed. But in Earthers, even ones like her, familial affection goes a long way. And I always overpaid. So if Simone did sell her body, she'd be giving up a very lucrative source of income. Namely, myself. I refrained from telling Kasana that. Dinah stole Simone's account code and cleaned her out, then got off planet as fast as she could. She is an adolescent as you reckon it, correct? I made the affirmative gesture. How was she not caught? Culture clash. Even after all these cycles, there was still so much Kasana didn't know. But then I couldn't repair a hull in raw vacuum. So there it was. Females mature faster, physically, than males, especially on worlds like Davalos. She could pass for adult to most Earthers. Kasana shifted against her tree. On Paleo Ask, leaving the world tree before adulthood usually meant death by consumption. The top of her planet's food chain was occupied by a form of crystallophage, Surviving to maturity was hard enough without getting within reach of one of those things. I have more video, I said. She came through customs and took a cubicle at the top. Kasana watched Dinah leave the tiny room, then return with an armful of blankets. Impractical. Why does she not fabricate them inside? She's probably out of money and had to steal them, I said having already thought it through. 
and because she is not here legitimately, she could not simply ask for help. Yes, that. A moment later, the screen showed two carts chiming Dinah's door. There was no answer, so they forced it. For all their skinny-limbed lankiness, Karch were twice as strong as the average Earther. I watched, hiding my emotions, as they subdued her and carried her off camera. I surmise there are things Simone neglected to tell you. My throat was tight. Yes, there were. This is the last of it, I said. The last time the cameras picked up either of those two. Kasana's form went liquid for a moment, a shimmer that was barely noticeable except to those who knew her well. I know where that is. And what? Maybe you can tell me then. I recognized that behavior in Kasana. It was fear. I know the physical location, but that's it. It's new. Wasn't here when I left. Only in the last three cycles was it present. She moved off her tree to sit beside me on the lounge. I smelled her fear now. Sage and ice. The Karch applied for an entertainment license and were denied. But enough money changed hands that they were allowed to create it anyway. It? Iniquity. Shit. A pause. Excrement? (laughs) I actually laughed. But knowing iniquity like I did, humor was the last thing on my mind. Cage! Simone! We regarded each other over the open channel. What happened? I finally asked her. What did you do? What do you mean, me? Her earthish was all smooth vowels and swallowed consonants, colloquially pronounced in the extreme. You ran out on me. It's not my fault that you couldn't be bothered to stay and be a father to your child. You stole a sample of my DNA! I took a couple of deep breaths, trying to calm myself. I used a biocontrol implant. You knew I didn't want to have a child with you. No, you just wanted to practice the mechanics of it. (laughs) She gave the low chuckle that, so many cycles ago... It made things inside me clench tight. Now it just made my reactor run cooler. When she saw that on my face, she stopped smiling. Have you found her? I know where she is, if that's what you mean. Then why are you calling me from... Her eyes flicked away for a fraction. She frowned. What are you doing on that nightmare of a place? I felt my lips thin. Figuring out why the Karch attacked my daughter. Our daughter. My daughter, I snapped, and dragged her to our local branch of iniquity. Simone blanched. It wasn't a pretty thing to behold. Cage. She said, all serious now. You have to help her. I... I didn't know. Didn't know what, Simone? I'd done more than my share of research before placing this call. They didn't know she was skating from school. Didn't know she was gambling to earn extra cash. Didn't know about her debts or her drugs or her rented room three resgen away. Simone's mouth moved, but nothing came out. I told Kasana that Earthers believe in familial affection. Where the hell were you? She winced, but her color was already starting to come back. The overseer came to me first, she said. I figured she needed to learn a lesson, so I told him to imprison her. You idiot. Cage! No! I slammed my fist into the wall next to the screen. You know what iniquity is like, and you ignored my daughter enough that she ran off a debt that will take three lifetimes to repay. At... Iniquity. Iniquity, Simone! Cage, I... Shut up and listen. I said, my voice low and soft. The next time you hear from me, I'll be with a negotiator. I expect all filial rights turned over to me. 
Simone looked like she wanted to argue, but I held up a hand. Keep the money. She relaxed then. Thank you, Cage. Thank... You're disgusting, I said. I'll send you a message if I get her out alive. Either that, or we're both dead. I snapped off the channel before Simone could respond, then dropped into the lounge, face in my hands. Maybe I'd never actually met Dinah, but she was still my child. Biologically, if nothing else. And even if she hadn't been, no one deserved Iniquity's version of imprisonment. Not even Simone. The Ten Families didn't have an embassy on Waypoint 5. Most of the Confederacy hated them. If not actively, then at least with the low-level dislike of a created boogeyman. They fought the Confederacy to a stalemate ten cycles ago. Could have beaten them. But we all have to live in the same galaxy. Still, it's not safe to be human on Waypoint 5. Which is why my public ID says I'm from Earth 6 one of the colony worlds set up by the Tatin when Earthers finished ruining their planet. I've never been to Earth-6. I hear it's hot, two suns and a thin atmosphere. But Earthers had no room to complain. If the Ten Families had had an embassy here, I'd have gone there. Instead, I chimed the door on the 78th level, close to the outer hull. A scanner unfolded from the wall, and I placed my hand on it. There was the sharp pinch of a needle, then the soft heat of a repair beam. Only after my blood had been verified did the door open. The first difference was the light, low and diffuse. By that I knew the human representative was a Sagat. Their planet was bathed in perpetual twilight. The second was the air quality. It smelled fresher in here, and I knew when I left that it would take a little while to get used to the station's recycled air. The third was the welcome. Greetings. Welcome to my home, Cage Gray. I didn't smile. Greetings, Daniel Sagat. Thank you for seeing me. Sagat offered me a seat on a low-slung chair one far more comfortable than the standard fare in this place. Sagat himself sat in a floating chair, anti-grav, I guessed, and, after we'd greeted each other, he'd commanded his desk to move aside, rather than simply come around. But then, Sagat's were the seconds, and Gray's only a distant branch of the Nakamura's, the eighths. Even though I was technically a Hollander, one of the firsts, if only by adoption, my name determined my place in the Ten Families. This kind of confusion was only one reason I avoided other humans whenever possible. How may I help you, Eighth Grey? Sagat asked. I folded my hands, trying to remember the properly deferential posture I should be taking. It is a family matter, Second Sagat. I spoke slowly. It had been some time since I'd said anything in English. Family above all, he said, a mantra of the ten. Family above all, an echo, nothing more. It's my daughter, Second Sagat. She's been imprisoned by the Karch. We have a treaty with them, Sagat said, distaste evident. Contact our embassy on their planet. It's a bit more immediate than that. Oh? Sagat had straight, well-groomed eyebrows, and he raised them. Do tell. I hated this posturing, but I kept it up for Dinah's sake. She's in iniquity. A moment of silence. Here, you mean? Yes, here. Hence my presence. I'm sure you know my record, and that I am not pleased to be back again. Of course. There was a screen on the arm of Sagat's floating chair, and I was fairly certain my records had appeared there as soon as my blood had been verified. Why not file a grievance with the station manager? 
I'm confident he would make the appropriate appeals on your behalf. You're probably right, Second Sagat. And he was. I knew it for certain. I was once the station's chief of security, after all. But time is of the essence, and appeals are slow. Sagat manipulated the control on his armrest. I believe you. But if I intervene, I would be doing so with the authority of the Ten Families. I'm not authorized to break the treaty. I hate my people. Very well, I said. I appreciate your time, Second Sagat. But as I started to rise, intending to leave, he held up a hand. Just because I can do nothing officially, Eighth Grey, he said, that does not mean I can do nothing at all. Family, remember? Of course. Slimy bastard actually enjoyed watching me squirm. And I had squirmed, purely for his benefit. Showing discomfort of any kind undermined my privateer captain persona. What can you do, Second Sagat? Sagat ejected a card from his armrest and flipped it to me. Names, bribes, information. I am but one man, and I have no real power here. If you could wait, I might be able to get more personnel, but as it stands... Quite. Not something I normally said, but appearances were everything to the ten in situations like this. Thank you, Second Sagat. Family above all, Eighth Grey. Family above all. I left his suite, and so help me, I actually appreciated the stale, brittle air of the corridor. I had what I needed, and despite my dislike of my origins, for me, family really was above all. If saving my daughter meant swallowing my pride, so be it. The first hurdle of iniquity is the fact that I'm not female. The Karch strictly control sex and species ratios in their establishments, and an apparent earther wasn't desirable in any case. Which was where Kasana came in. We'd spent a tenth perfecting her appearance, and even the two Karch guarding the door looked impressed. Kasana was molded, dressed wouldn't be an accurate word, to be almost my height and we'd found ways to redistribute her mass so she looked more like an attractive earther, albeit one made of magenta crystal. I suggested she try to approximate it to tin, but she'd never been able to pull that off in all the cycles I'd known her. We wish entrance. Kasana subvocalized. For you, said the smaller Karch. No charge, but earthers aren't welcome. We're not equipped for them. He will behave. Her hand went to my shoulder and squeezed, hard enough that I actually winced. You have my word. Take a little more than that. Give it to him. I used my other hand, the one not at the end of a bruised shoulder, to hand over a card. The Karch ran it through his comp, and his tongue flicked out. Karch don't smile. So many races in the Confederacy don't have that little piece of body language but I know faces, and this was the face of Avarice. Go in, he said. Enjoy. Thank you. Kasana eased her grip as the door opened. We passed through, and it slid shut behind us before the inner door allowed admittance. Ouch. It wasn't easy for me to subvocalize, but Kasana had taught me the basics, and I'd never forgotten. That hurt. Sorry. Which way? I checked my comp. Through the main gaming room, then down two levels. I rubbed my shoulder. I should get used to that, I added. You'll probably have to do worse. Cage. She told me. I am not comfortable with this. Me neither, but look on the bright side. That is? They can report you, but they're likely to kill me. Not as bright as I had hoped. I suppose not. I guided Kasana down the long corridor, lined with body sensors and audio pickups, from what Sagat's card had told me. 
and into the game room. The station did have a couple of casinos where anyone who wanted to lose could swipe their cards and watch their balances drop. But where the Titin were fair in negotiations, the Karch were fairer still in games of chance. Plus, in iniquity, anyone can bet anything they want. Money, ships, services, even other people. And every bid is binding. Welching on a bet means imprisonment, pain, or even death. Just one of many reasons I'd fought so hard to keep places like this off the station. Apparently, my replacement had fewer scruples. Kasana and I managed to get to the back of the large, but surprisingly quiet room before she was accosted. I like Earthers. I'll play you for it. Kasana's grip tightened on my shoulder again as we looked up, and up, and up, into the bronze, hairless face of a well-dressed Supak woman. What's your game? She asked. I'll play whatever stakes you want. Short of life or self. He is mine, Kasana said, and it was lucky the Supak couldn't hear the fear in the sub-vocalized tones. Or maybe she did, and she liked it. I will not wager him. The woman removed Kasana's hand from my shoulder and lifted me bodily. I want him, she said again, and the desire dripping from her voice made me remember just how much I like Supak women. But now was not the time. I have a use for him. I couldn't help it. I laughed. <laughs> What's so funny? I didn't speak. The woman looked a question at Kasana, and when I gave her a hand signal, she offered the affirmative gesture to the Supak. The woman put me down, and then, without warning, her huge hand whipped across <laughs> my face. Only her grip on my other shoulder and now both were hurting, kept me from flying across the room. I swallowed blood and ran my tongue over my teeth, but they all seemed okay. Talk. Comply. Well, that sealed it. At least I could be diplomatic. I know a little about Supak physiology, I said. I've had Supak lovers. They thought always brings a little smile to my face. Her bronze face flashed to a copper orange, and she pushed me away. Keep it, she grumbled. Anyone who can tame him deserves it. Anyone who can. We made it through the exit door, and I snuck a repair device out of my pocket. Here, I said thickly, pressing it into Kasana's hand. Before I bleed too much. I swallowed again and opened my mouth. And, with the quick skill of a master engineer, she closed the cut the Supak woman had given me. Where are the stairs? Kasana asked. I swapped the medical tool for my comp and pulled up the map. It doesn't say, beyond one of these two doors. I pointed at the ones to my left. Guesses? We could wait. She suggested. And see if anyone comes out. Waiting's not my strong suit. I know. She smiled. Pass the time. Explain your words to the Supak. Oh, that. <laughs> I gave her a chuckle. Supak are like us. Like people of Earth extraction, I mean. There are theories of parallel development. But never tell a Supak she looks like an Earther. I have seen disagreements on the topic. Kasana went behind me and ran her hands over my shoulders, warmth and a slight vibration helping to ease the pain. Better? <laughs> Much. I sighed. But you have not explained fully. No, but it's gauche to discuss old lovers with your partner in crime, especially if she's one of them. Cage. And here her voice began to change in pitch. I can cause pain this way as well. Don't get carried away in the role. When she remained silent, I let out a slow breath. Ah, <sighs> Supak are like larger versions of Earthers, in every way. But that hurts the woman during reproduction. 
and fertilization. The silence changed, and then I heard Kasana's subvocalized chuckle. <laughs> Earther mating is amusing. You seem to like it. Kasana's scent changed, her equivalent of a blush. It is difficult to imagine you mating with a supak, but not impossible. Just as hard for me to think about you getting impregnated by a tree. I had a feeling Kasana wanted to say something, but one of the doors opened in, and a Kanidun, a female in the service cast, emerged, pushing an anti-grav cart. Behind her, we saw a kitchen. Kasana slipped quickly into a roll, nudging me toward the other door, which slid open obediently. We descended two flights of stairs, but the next door we needed to open wasn't as tractable. I took out an electronic pick, but Kasana touched my arm. I am an engineer, she explained, laying her hand on the access pad. Allow me. I watched her fingers, really just extrusions of shaped crystal, form a flat, narrow strip. She swiped her fingers, humming a complicated tune in minor sevens, and the door moved aside. What is it the Earthers say? No idea. Never been. This level was a maze of small rooms. In each, behind the one-way force field, we saw two beings crammed into a tiny living space. They were in various degrees of filth and depression. I very much doubted that Simone knew this was the Karch idea of imprisonment. Abominable. Kasana's sub-vocalized voice was almost inaudible to me. How is this permitted? The new management of Waypoint 5, I suppose. I led her now, following the instructions on my screen. And don't let any of them out. How did you know? I know you, I said, turning left, then right. One escape we can cover. A whole ward. I made the negative gesture. Kasana smelled sad and indignant at the same time. A clash of iron and fresh grass. And I offered a smile. Let's save Dinah first. Then you can go on your crusade. It only took a little while longer to find Dinah's cage. It was empty. This is wrong. Very. I consulted the comp again, but this was all the information I had. Come on, let's get out of here. Perhaps not! Came a voice from behind us. I spun, reaching for my sword before I remembered it would have been out of character, so I left it in Kasana's cabin. Why are you trespassing? The speaker was a towering Karch female, tiny rows of teeth bared, skin mottled, scales scarred. She had a projectile gun strapped to her left wrist and a double-bladed knife in her right hand. Behind her were two males, similarly armed. I held up my hands. I'm sorry, I said. I have authorization. Prove it! That was the one good thing about iniquity. Everything could be bought, including prisoners. I took out the card and handed it over. The female swiped it and, without warning, all the corridor lights flashed to their highest intensity. The males crouched at their eyes, but the female stayed on her guard. It was enough. I dropped one of my clear steel blades from my sleeve to my hand and threw a punch at the female, aiming for her arm. The edge of my blade drew a deep furrow in her scales. She swung with her own knife, but I grabbed her wrist and used her leverage to pull myself past. I dispatched the blinded males quickly, syringes flung into their soft necks, putting them to sleep. I don't kill when I don't have to, and they were in the wrong place at the wrong time. So was the female, whose clawed hands were around Kasana's arm. Blue frost was forming on the scales of her chest, and her throat moved in a futile attempt to scream. I put her out with a sharp chop to the base of her skull. Almost couldn't reach it, she was so tall. And as she fell, a few scales ripped away, frozen to Kasana's hand. Come on, I hissed. We have to go. 
Kasana stared at the scales stuck to her, wheeling her body back to normal temperature, watching them drop to the floor. Oh, hell. I grabbed her wrist and pulled, hoping she wouldn't have set her not inconsiderable mass in place. But she was too shocked to have done so, and she followed my lead as I found the service exit and shoved her through. Quick, I whispered. You have to change back. The chief of dog ops was never there, remember? Kasana didn't speak, but she must have heard me. The crystal of her body shifted and changed, wet chiming noises set off by the eerie tune she was sub-vocalizing. Come on, I said again, and stop with the dirge. You didn't kill her, and neither did I. I didn't? No. If anyone was going to be killed, I'd have done it. Oh. That didn't seem to reassure her, but at least she looked like herself again. A shame her people were so sensitive. They'd make great criminals. We caught the lift back to Kasana's level and made our way to her cabin. Inside, I exchanged my recently fabricated costume for regular clothes, replacing the clear steel blades in their holsters and buckling on my sword belt. Where are you going? Kasana was back on her tree, clearly shaken, taking sustenance and comfort from it. I have to find Dinah, I said. And I have a few words for Sagat as well. Take care, she warned. If you were lied to, it is likely he knows you seek him. I touched the control to open her door. Good. This time... The door to Sagat's quarters denied my entrance after testing my blood. I pressed the chime again, but only received a message, into tin high text. Never let it be said that the ten families will use a simple tongue when a complicated one is available. My command of the written version of high wasn't as good as my spoken, but I was pretty sure Sagat was telling me to come back later, and doing so in an extremely rude fashion. I came prepared, though. I unwrapped a stick of burn paste and spread it along the frame of the door. It reacted with the metal wall and, in a fraction or two, I had a long, narrow opening into which I could wedge my sword. From there, it was easy to release the latch. The sword, which had a mild electrostatic charge to protect it from dust and debris, interrupted the magnetic lock. The door slid open and I yanked out the sword bringing it to a vertical guard position and slipping through the opening. I needn't have worried. Sagat wasn't in the outer office where he'd received me before. I tabbed the door shut behind me and crossed to Sagat's desk. No winds there. He'd left his computer locked down, and I had neither the inclination nor the skill to hack it open. It was just one of the things to do. Look for adversaries. Try to steal information or anything else useful, that sort of thing. Sagat must have assumed his lock was secure, or that no one would try to break into his office, because the door behind his desk wasn't locked. Beyond it, I found a well-appointed dining area at the center of a large, open space. There was an entertainment area in one corner, screen, lounges and so on, and a spotless kitchen in another. I bit my cheek to stifle a chuckle, No Sagat would demean himself by manually preparing food. That's why the ten brought indentures on the ships all those hundreds of cycles ago. I couldn't help myself, though. I did cook, and I had to examine the appliances and utensils. I clicked my tongue. What a tremendous waste. I wouldn't kill for these in my own kitchen, but I might be willing to rough someone up. Which reminded me, where was Sagat anyway? There were no doors other than the one I'd entered through, but I saw no sleeping area. Where the hell had he gone? The panel outside showed he was present. There must be... A noise reached my ears. Very faint, but if I could hear Kasana's emotions in her sub-vocalizations, then I could certainly hear this. Shouting. Angry, frustrated shouting. Cursing, too. I followed the sounds until I reached the entertainment area. They were coming from behind the screen. I examined the wall, ran my fingers around the edges of the screen, but hit a fail. Should have just checked the occasional table first. 
Right there on Sagat's control panel was a key that moved the screen aside. Bloody inbred fucking bastard son of a whore! The voice paused for breath, then started up again. Canid-loving, supak-sucking sex fiend! I hope it rots off and is eaten by gnats! Colorful, isn't she? Sagat was leaning on some sort of podium, about two resglin away from a young Earther woman bound by her wrists, hanging in midair, apparently unsupported. Her clothing was ragged, torn in places and stained with what looked like dried karch blood. Limp, dirty black hair hung in front of her face, fluttering as she breathed. Yes, this young woman was definitely my daughter. She was behaving exactly as I would have at her age. Before the Confederacy Star League. Before becoming a trader. Before learning what happened to my child. Let her down, Second Sagat, I said, moving between them. Let her go. Are you making a demand, Eighth Grey? He actually smiled. What right does an Eighth have to demand anything from a Second? I shifted the sword from a vertical guard to an overhand strike position. Just let her go, and neither of us will darken your entry again. Uh, uh, Uh-uh-uh. Sagat made a negative noise. I paid the Karch quite a sum for their half-human. I'm not letting her go. Not yet, at any rate. Dinah's eyes, a greenish hazel reminiscent of Simone's, flitted from Sagat to me. It was clear she didn't speak or understand English. The insults had been in common, with the occasional English word thrown in where it didn't translate. Her eyes were still on me. She must have recognized me, or maybe Simone had shown her a holograph. Her mouth moved for a moment, no sound coming out, before she could speak. Dad? Sagat slammed his fist on the podium, and Dinah (laughs) screamed, body bending like a longbow. Speak a civilized tongue! He snarled in high. Never sully my ears with your primitive garbage! Stop! I shouted, stepping closer to Sagat. Stop it! He lifted his hand, and Dinah sagged in her invisible bonds, gasping and spluttering. I won't kill her, he said. But it's so hard to find humans, even partial ones, in this forsaken part of the Confederacy. Do you know how long it's been since I've enjoyed the pleasures of the flesh? I'd been a traitor too long to let my anger show as anything more than a flexing of my fingers on the hilt of the sword. Let her go, Second Sagat. I moved closer. Now. I have an alternative proposition, he said. His fingers moved across the podium, and a banking window opened on the wall screen which Sagat must have closed behind me while I wasn't looking. As I watched, he transferred a quarter million sethen into my account. Leave now, and the money is yours. Stay. His hand went to a control that I quickly recognized as the one he'd used to torture Dinah. The negotiator in me, skills learned from all my time working with the Tatin, appeared to consider the offer. What? This time, Dinah said it in common, and Sagat didn't hurt her. You can't! I made the negative gesture. Ah, the offer's too good. I said in high, sheathing the sword and closing the flap over the hilt. Where do I verify second Sagat? Sagat's smile was sickening, as was the horrified expression on Dinah's face. But he beckoned me forward. Here! He pointed to a panel on his podium. Key in your code and run your car. I did as he instructed, and in less than a fraction, the transfer-approved glyph flashed across the wall screen. Reasonable, Sagat said. I knew you would see it my way, Eighth Grey. I heard Dinah start to sob. (laughs) How long, Second Sagat? Pardon? Until I can collect her. Ah. He considered the question. At least a year. Of course, he was using human measurements. Not that it mattered. After that long, I suppose I'll be bored of her. If she behaves, she might even be in a condition where you'll want her back. For a quarter million, 
I can forgive a little damage. I'm sure. Sagat held out his hand. I will bid you farewell now, Eighth Grey. Yes, I said, reaching across the podium. You will. Sagat had an instant to be surprised as he gripped one of my clear steel blades. The smug idiot hadn't even looked down. What? what That was the last thing he ever said. The other blade was already in my left hand, and I slashed it across his throat. He burbled, clutching the wound, but there was just too much blood. Sagat slumped to the floor and was dead before I found the button to release Dinah from her bonds. I'm sorry, I said over the channel. I couldn't stay. Subvocalizations don't carry over comms. Kasana's expression was one of resigned hurt as her message scrolled across the bottom of the screen. I understand. I won't be back this time. I felt bad about abandoning Kasana again, especially after last time, but Sagat's death had triggered a call to security as well as a dead man switch that notified the ten families. I knew because I had a sliver of my iliac crest missing where I'd pay the surgeon to remove my own switch. I had no choice. I know. Family above all, as your people say, correct? That one hurt, and I caught myself reaching for the screen. Space it, Kasana. How could I choose? He was going to torture my child. Your child that you had never seen before now. Before my eyes, Kasana's form went liquid and her features began to melt away. In mere fractions, she was the faceless, sexless, crystalline biped I'd met twenty cycles ago. I do not fully comprehend familial affection. You know this, but we share many of the emotions of yours. I am hurt, Cage. I will not allow you to hurt me again. I swallowed hard. I can only apologize, I said, my voice tight. I wish it hadn't gone this way. As do I. Even in this form, I could read her emotions. At least then my hopes would not have been rekindled. Kasana cut the connection before I could respond. I slumped in my seat, chin to my chest. I was a fool. But I couldn't wallow in self-pity. Dinah, my daughter, was asleep in an unused crew cabin. And when she woke up, we would have to have a little chat about what she was going to do now that her father, her legal guardian, was in more than a little trouble with the second most powerful starfaring culture in the explored galaxy. I pushed myself up and out of my chair. The navigation computer would keep us on course. The least I could do was make Dinah a nice meal, with real, unfabricated food, as a peace offering. It was time to start taking care of my daughter. Family, above all. Author's Note Hi, this is Josh Roseman, not the trombonist, the other one. And here's a few fun facts about Return to Waypoint 5. Number one, I wrote this story entirely by hand. I also wrote the next five installments of it entirely by hand. Number two, this story was originally published in late 2014, and that's about the time I sent it to the Dune Steve, but I knew it would be a really long story, and I was willing to wait because I knew the production values would be great. Number three, this is the story that got me into the 2013 Tao's Toolbox writing workshop. If you've never been to a writing workshop, I highly, highly recommend it. And number four, Just a couple of days ago, actually, I had a flash of inspiration, and I started rewriting Return to Waypoint 5 as a novel. So hopefully I'll be able to finish that within a year or so. Anyway, that's it for me. Thanks again for listening, and remember, if you would like to read more of my stuff, you can find it at roseplusman.com, or you can read my latest novel, After the Apocalypse, at tiny.cc slash ATA. Later. All right.
right. Thanks for that author's note, Josh. Always a pleasure. That was our story. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, it was a long one. I hope you enjoyed that. It's been, I don't know, we get an episode out so seldom that I suppose we probably owe people a good long story when we actually do get one out. Cool. Well, we've got a lot of other people to thank besides just Josh. I, mean, I don't know how we're going to keep straight all of those voices that you just heard. Yeah, there was a great deal of them. Luckily, I had some forethought on that. I knew that we were going to need something like that. So when we finished reading the story as a group live on, well, I guess we read it live and then we recorded it. So I can say live, right? And then right after we finished, I had everybody that could hang around and we had a little post chat debrief kind of thing wow man you planned ahead when you uh when we were doing this yes i did the young virile handsome big anklevich really knew what he was doing that's right yeah i was i was expecting this one to not be finished until it was time for our 10th anniversary so i knew that i was gonna <laughs> oh that was such a long time ago i'm sad anyways um yeah, so let's let's go to that. This is our recording with all the voice actors. So you can check that out. And we'll be back on the other side of it with more about the whole process and the story and the, and the whole bit. Take it away, Big Anklevich. Yeah, but, but, but you are Big Anklevich, Lieutenant Dan. <laughs> so this will be an interesting thing that we can do. We'll have a cast list and we'll have all the cast chime in as to what it was that they did. So... First of all, our narrator, who was also named Cage Gray, was played by... Rich Outfield. Yay! And then we had a Kanedun Customs Officer, who was played by... Chris White. Nice. <laughs> this is just interesting to be able to have you guys chime in like that. Uh, <laughs> Sana was played by... Bria Burton. All right, now here's where the, the whole thing breaks down. We have <laughs> Simone, who was played by Tina Kolakowski, who has had to drop off the call because she had to go and care for her children. She had thrown a bunch of Cheerios on the ground, I think, and while they were, like, picking them up, she ran in and talked with us, and uh, it occupied them just enough that she was able to get through and get out of here. But Simone played... Oh, sorry. Tina played Simone... And also Dinah. She did the voice of both of those two characters. Then uh, we had Daniel Sagat, who was played by... Gino Moreto. Hey. And a... I called him Karch at Iniquity Door. <laughs> uh, one of those policeman number one kind of uh, character names. Who was played by... Cameron Howard. All right. And the Supak woman was played by... Bill Bowman. Nice. He was wearing high heels for the, uh, <laughs> the, 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 the whole the, the, recording. He, he suffered. Look damn good. Yeah. <laughs> and then, lastly, we had a towering Karch female played by... Leo Godin. And, and one other thing, a one of the... I guess it was Karch's. One of the Karch's who was blinded when the lights came on... The screech was yelled by... That would be me, John Hyam. Yay! So, <laughs> we all managed to uh, get a little something in there, so that was fun. Was he wrapped um, up like a deuce? That's, <laughs> uh, I, I was the one in the right. red, uh, in nice. the red j jumper. <laughs> ah. <laughs> so, yeah. All right. This was uh, way back when we did this w another time where we had an entire group online on a Skype call and we did, uh, what was the story called? The... Oh, yeah, it was... Um... Wiki History? Wiki yeah, History, Yeah, there we go. Yeah. Thank you. Wiki History, where many of us got together and we did this uh, over Skype. And I think you know, we did it because we could, um, but the idea originally for doing such a thing was for this story. This is where we first came up with, let's get everybody on Skype and we'll do it for this story because this is going to be something that it would really be nice if we had everybody online together so that we could um, talk things over and try and figure out accents and try and figure out what a karch sounds like versus a kind of dune, etc. 
But unfortunately, this story is also, I don't know, it's, it's more, I think it's, I think it's more than 10,000 words. I don't know how many it is. I, I think it used to say, but I deleted it off of my, my copy of the file. But it was a very long story anyways, we'll just put it that way. And so it took us a while to ever get around to marking it up, getting it all ready to go, highlighting all the lines all the way through it, etc, etc. And I think we were just a little daunted by the whole thing too. Yeah, Rish, every time he would talk about it, would be like, yeah, we, oh, it'll be so cool, and we'll do this and this. And because of that, that's why we're never going to do it, because it's way too much work. So now we've got all you guys here still on the line with us. What did you think? Um, how did you enjoy the experience? It's great. It's fun. Yeah, it was pretty cool. Yeah, I liked it a lot. It was great. Yeah, I thought it was really fun to be a part of. It was... I, I'm definitely up for it anytime. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Same here. Oh, yeah. I think it was just a, a really cool story, very unique, and like Rish mentioned earlier, it was really good world building. Yeah, he spins a good story, old uh, Mr. Roseman, doesn't he? It's, uh, it's, it's very interesting, very complex. He's very good at the trombone as well, I heard. Yes, yes, he is. <laughs> <laughs> He's become famous for it. Uh, now, Bria and John... You two were the only two that were here last time around, right? I mean, Tina was here too, but she's not here anymore, so yeah, I ask her. Yeah, that's right. Um, how did you guys find uh, this experience to be different or similar uh, to the last? It was pretty similar. Yeah, it was a lot easier for me, clearly. But I think <laughs> just on this one, the last time we did this, it was my first time recording anything like this, and so it was a little bit nerve-wracking. This time it was much more relaxed. I, mean, I know I obviously just had the one grunt, but um, just mm. even doing that, it was it was good fun. Yeah, much more relaxing, mm. much more fluid. I think, uh, you know, you guys obviously know what you're doing as well, so that helps, you know, with your guidance and everything. I had a lot more mm -hmm. lines this time, for sure. Yeah, I thought you did a really great job. I really liked your take on the character. Yeah, um, I mean, I, I was intimidated by the idea of, you know, make it sound really unique and different, and I'm, I <laughs> felt like it wasn't that different from my <laughs> normal voice in many ways, but everybody else was different, so it made me unique, <laughs> I guess. I think you gave it a, a real sort of fluid gravitas, which is yeah. it's, it's a hard thing to do, I think. Thanks, yeah. You know, slight in intimidation at first, and then nobody was complaining, so I just kept going with it. <laughs> Actually, it's kind of close to what I would imagine from that role, because it's it's a character that's not super used to emotion. So I think you actually played it exactly what the character seemed to be, mm. at least to me anyway. Everybody did such a good job. I mean, you know, considering most of us aren't voice actors, mm -hmm. it certainly came across really well from from this end. All right. So now those of you who... We're not here last time around. I know, Leo, you were saying that you were pretty nervous about this whole thing. How did it go for you? Did you feel like it worked out all right? Do you feel like you, I don't know, tripped and fell on your face? Are you are you feeling more comfortable now that we've been at it? Yeah, it was fine. Um, you know, I wish I could have found a voice. I tried to get this kind of uninterested soldier, you know, female soldier's voice and had no clue how to do it and didn't come close to it. <laughs> but other than that, I, I kind of got that, that whiny, obnoxious little alien instead of the, oh, you know, the giant. Good. But um, mm -hmm. yeah, it was kind of cool. I mean, I really wanted to just hear how this was done as much as anything. So it was cool to participate. It's yeah, my first time, so it's, it's terrific. It was, yeah. it was a, a lot less nerve wracking. Uh, than, than I thought. I was anticipating being nervous, but it's you made it very easy, very smooth. Oh, Huge I'm fun. Glad, glad to hear that. Yeah. Yep. You, you were saying, Chris, that you had tried to participate in other podcasts before, but had some kind of issues with your mic or something like that. And so, oh, you, uh, yeah, yeah. Is, yeah. is this your first time, therefore? It is, yeah. I, I, I recorded a lot of stuff before that wasn't used, and the one that was used sounded not good to me when when it came back over the air and i thought my god it sounds like i'm in a cupboard so i thought oh i must be doing horrible things at this end but after you broadcast the last thing that i sent to you those comments on the story it sounded exactly as it sounded at my end i thought oh 
<laughs> things ain't as bad as I thought. Maybe, maybe I can do something with this, you know, and, and not just embarrass myself. So it's been super. It's always a bit freaky hearing your own voice uh, for the first time on recording as well, though, isn't it? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it definitely is. That's one of those things that I know took a long time for me to get over. Because, yeah, nobody likes the sound of their own voice. Well, I guess there are people. Uh, Donald Trump likes the sound of their own voice. <laughs> but there are... Yeah, He's listening, that. you know. <laughs> That's probably true. <laughs> Most people hear the sound of their voice on a recording. They go, oh, is that how I sound? Oh, crap. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. And I heard way back when I was, I think I was in high school when I heard this, the reason why it sounds so wrong to you when you when you do this, as opposed to, you know, what you expect your voice to sound like, is because your ears pick up your voice in, in two different directions. Like they get a resonant a resonance that's coming back through your actual skull into the yeah. back side of your ear, right, and then yeah. of course what comes in your ears as well. So they get a more rich sound to your voice than everybody else gets. And so when you hear a different sound, you're like, oh crap, do I sound like that? It's, it's um, weird how your accent seems to change as well, though. The the way that you sound, the way that you speak or think you speak. Suddenly you go, oh, wow, I've got a real, what is that? <laughs> it's, yeah. it, it's, it can sound really broad sometimes. I or, agree, because you're from affected, Hoboken, you know, New Jersey, and listen that? to you. I, it's just not <laughs> he sounds so suave, you know? <laughs> but yeah, that's, uh, that's definitely a thing that you have to learn to deal with, you know, after hundreds of episodes. Uh, I've managed to get over that. I think for the first while, it was hard. And I know there was a guy that we worked with on episode one, and uh, yeah, he didn't want to work with us again after he had heard his voice on episode one. He was just like, oh, I hate the way my voice sounds. Yeah, I think I'll let you guys just go on without me. <laughs> okay, now, Bill, you got to play <laughs> the f female Supak woman. Yes. And now Supak you woman. started out... <laughs> You started talking, and then you got a little bit of direction from Rish, and I'm, I'm <laughs> guessing that it was probably something that you'd never heard someone ask of you before. No, no, I've never been told you have to play a sexier woman than what you are trying to do now. <laughs> now, the yeah. other stuff that I recorded, when I recorded for other things, just a couple of other things, it was like, it was all bad guys. So I always had to be a bad guy instead of, like I said, sexy woman number two. Sexy woman in den of iniquity. That's what this one was, right? Yeah, yeah that's yeah. right. Yeah, that stuff is extra, okay? <laughs> yeah, but as, as was said, they, they shipped me a, a pair of high heels that I had to wear through the entire recording. Wow. Um, I'm impressed yeah, was, by your dedication. <laughs> it, it was fun to listen to you try and be more sexy, I'll have to admit. <laughs> Hope it comes through. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I'm not sure how it'll turn out because we, uh, since you're an alien, we're going to probably mess with your voice a little bit and stuff like that. So I guess we'll see oh, good. how that goes. <laughs> um, and then we had Gino. You probably had, I don't know, I would say either the second or third largest part, probably third, because I think Kasana yeah. count as the second largest part. Now, you've sent us a few things, like with our little contests that we've done and stuff like that mm -hmm. but how much experience have you had uh doing this kind of stuff before with uh, vocal recordings um this sort of thing not a huge amount i mean i've done the a couple of things for you guys and i uh, uh rish and marshall have been kind enough to have me on the delusions of grandeur once so the, i think that was my first podcasting thing and like i've got a kind of background in drama and performance stuff so it's not a, a huge amount, it's more of a theory, but uh, I'm, I'm reasonably comfortable with it. Yeah, I thought you did a great job. I really enjoyed listening to you try and uh, uh, deal with trying to change your accent, because, you know, we wanted to make it sound, I don't know, alien, different, you know, futuristic or whatever, and so we had you trying to do an American accent. I'm really happy if it was actually kind of an, a future thing, so I could sort of, yeah, you can blame that on um, linguistic divergence to cover up my appalling American accent. Yeah, well, that's <laughs> I, that's what I think. It makes it work perfect. You know, we're able to do that. We can just say, 
Yeah, uh, future. you know, <laughs> yeah, it's totally different. And it should be, you know, it shouldn't be something that actually goes on right here and now. But yeah, I really enjoyed your performance. I enjoyed the, uh, the haughtiness of every uh, thing that you had to say for us. I thought it was a, a really well done. Thank you. Yeah, he was a really nasty piece of work, was old uh, Sagat. Yeah, all in all, I thought this was a, was a really good a really good experience. I just kind of hung along for the ride and, and listened in and, you know, offered some uh, direction here and there in case uh, somebody mispronounced something or called Dinah Dina or uh, <laughs> missed a word that they were supposed to say or something like that. I'm amazed at how Rish managed to sustain that accent all the way through. And he, his reading was very even, you know, it was terrific reading. Very good. Well, thanks, guys. I, I mean, I've been doing this a long time, but I felt nervous at the beginning because it's such a long story. Mm. And I thought, oh, shoot, what if my voice gives out or what if I forget? And there were a couple of times when I thought, oh, shoot, I'm doing Irish now. This isn't well, – when did this accent <laughs> change? But nobody the, called me on it, so. There was, there was a flicker of fake Sean, but just a flicker. <laughs> yes, I know what. Yes. No one's going to notice. Yeah. <laughs> Only the most devoted fans will notice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But yeah, that's one of the things that Rich is the best at. I don't know how he holds his accents as well as he does. He'll be able to switch back and forth and back and forth as we're going through, where for me, I'll lose it if I don't, you know, stick with the same accent always. You yeah. know, when I have to cut out and do something else, and then I try and come back, and oh, crap, I can't remember how it goes. <laughs> and so, yeah, that's tough. All right, well, I guess we probably better uh, bring this to a close anyways. Um, so I'm going to say thanks a lot to everybody. And, uh, well, I'd, I'd just like to say that you guys made me feel really comfortable um, mm. doing this. I mean, I've, I've had the, um, the one recording that I sent you guys in for the Christmas episode, and I was really nervous coming into this, but mm. it was a really uh, cozy, friendly atmosphere here. So uh, definitely... We all kind of feel like we know you anyway from the podcast. It always feels like you're sort of sitting around talking with friends, mm. listening to, to that. So it, it's made it much easier than it otherwise might have been. Much more comfortable, much more friendly. Thank you so much. It's well, been thank marvelous. You guys. Holy cow, I appreciate two hours, two and a half hours you guys dedicating to us. <laughs> we really are trying to have more episodes again. Thank you, Karen. So that's good news. So yeah, definitely yeah, let me know. Yeah, we're definitely uh, uh, looking to try and uh, record stories in this fashion a little more often. So we'll, we'll have every, we've got all your uh, contacts. Um, <laughs> and so, yeah, now we can uh, uh, do this more often. And uh, you hear I'm that excited they, for it. They know where we live. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least the time. We can get off. Skype to actually work. Uh, <laughs> all right. Thanks a lot, everybody. And uh, I'm going to stop my recording, but... Okay. Uh, thank you. Thanks, guys, for inviting yeah. us. Yeah, thanks, thanks, thanks for having us, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Good fun. Take Bye. care. Bye. 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 All right, so there you have it. That was our cast list. <laughs> <laughs> That's neat that we remembered to do that, because, boy, I, I listened to the production, and I couldn't even identify you on there it's just like oh geez it was that big no was that big i don't know who these people are <laughs> you know why you couldn't identify me because i didn't do a part on this episode why what's wrong with you uh we only had so many and we had so many volunteers that i was just like okay well i guess i'm gonna be the director and i will just keep an eye on things and make sure that uh, nobody screwed up and said the wrong word or I'm going to make sure that there's not too much fake Sean in Rish's accent. Oh, geez. <laughs> Beating that dead horse, huh? Oh, shoot. You know, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make it drink. <laughs> These dogs are barking, man. <laughs> let, yeah, let, let's talk a little bit about that accent. It, it, enough time had passed that it was all new to me, the accent. And uh, I'm a little too close to it because it was me. And yeah, I'm sure that that was my idea. But what were your thoughts on this accent and where did it come from? Where did it come from? Yeah. How did how did we decide how the accent would sound? What what accent I would do? And how did we decide to do an accent at all? 
Well, I think the decision to do the accent in the or do accents in the first place, any kind of accents, was just based on the the far future sci-fi that this was and we wanted it to not feel like uh you know like like those 1950s sci-fi movies where you know the aliens and everybody just talks like they're from Simi Valley or whatever you know they're they're not you know they're just like well golly Zorgon I can't believe the Earthman's defenses were quite easy to overcome, Zorgon. <laughs> yes, our cosmic rays are quite swell. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We, we, we wanted it to not turn out like that. We wanted it to sound at least semi-alien. Uh, I remember we were pleased with the fact that we had Gino from New Zealand. We had John Hyam, Chris White from uh england we had several different people from uh america we had people from around the world doing voices on the show so that was a a plus and we we purposefully had gino try and do an american accent despite him being a kiwi which is a brand of shoe polish i believe yeah i don't know how that turned out what everybody thought of that that turned out interesting Uh, My favorite part, I have to admit, was the part where where you're speaking English, and I'm doing the little, the quotes in the air there, with... Yes, our many viewers picked up on that. Yeah, with uh, Sagat. What was his first name? Something Sagat. Second Sagat. I think think it was Bob Sagat. Okay. <laughs> and so you're you're you suddenly change and you have like the you're back to an American accent, but you're speaking like really slowly and stumblingly and haltingly, and Gino's doing his American accent, and I, that was just my favorite part. I really enjoyed the way that came across. It really made that feel futuristic and foreign and, and different. You know what I mean? I think that was the biggest success. I thought your accent was fine. I don't know how... I, I didn't really have any input that I can remember of like what kind of accent you were going to do. I know that you were really... I mean, one of the main reasons why it took so long for us to ever record the story in the first place was because you're like, oh man, this sto- you know, there's this and there's that. There's all these foreign alien things and I want it to sound really alien. And uh, that was one of the main reasons why we didn't jump into it feet first and just go for it because we really wanted it to come out cool and felt i guess a little not up to the task do you remember why you picked that accent (laughs) i don't i i think it was supposed to be just sort of a what voice can i choose that i will be able to do consistently and i'm pretty sure it wasn't consistent through the whole story but but you know Good enough for government work, right? As they say. Yeah. But uh, there were a couple of times where I felt like I was trying to do Pavel Chekhov from the old Star Trek show. (laughs) Okay. I would hear and and he'd be like, Captain, the Klingons are attacking. And I'd be like, am I doing that on purpose? (laughs) But then there were other times where it's just like, I don't know what I'm doing there. And, And that was... That's what I wanted to achieve, is I didn't want it to sound like a specific accent. It was supposed to sound weird. Uh-huh. You know, alien, not not right, not placeable as anywhere. But yeah, that, that moment that you mentioned where suddenly I am speaking American, or however I did it, <laughs> that goes back to those old, that old film trope where when somebody started speaking with a foreign accent, even though they were speaking English, the audience understood that now they're speaking another language. And that's something that's completely gone away in film, except for in Wonder Woman last year, where suddenly Chris Pine starts speaking English with a German accent, and everybody around him is also speaking English with a German accent. And we're to understand they're speaking German right now. It was it's weird mm-hmm. that they did that and nobody else that I've talked to commented on it like it was weird so only I thought it was weird but how else do you do it in audio cuz in a, in Wonder Woman they could have had 
actors speaking German and had subtitles. But in right. audio, you can't do that. That's what they pretty much switched to in movies is having people speaking the actual language and just putting up subtitles. No matter how poorly they speak that language, you know. <laughs> but uh, you can't really do that with audio. There's no subtitles allowed. There's no crying in baseball. I, I don't know. I really thought that was cool. In my mind, I, I suppose he was speaking common the whole time. There was a few languages that he threw out, he tossed out there that sounded like they were earth derived oh didn't he mention like earther as well as being one of the languages yeah english and earther were different weren't they yeah there was like english and earther and then there was also common so yeah i don't know i just got i had the feeling that they were like kind of derived from similar things those three at least so that it it, it would make sense that it would just be a uh, slightly different earth accent that you could use to uh, indicate that that's what you were now speaking but yeah, I, th- I thought it worked pretty well. Did you, Do you think that in the end, we kept freaking Josh Roseman hanging on the line for so long with this story because we wanted to make it as good as possible? In the end, do you feel like it turned out the way you wanted it to? Or do you feel like you still had grander, more magnificent visions for it? Well... I mean, since this is our 10th anniversary episode, something that we learned along the way is that nobody was crazy enough to do full cast audio the way that we did. (laughs) And if they were, they wouldn't be insane enough to do a 55-minute story in full cast. (laughs) So I guess that's my way of saying nobody else would have done what you just heard. Now, whether you as a listener appreciate that or whether you would have been just as happy with a single narrator, but like Justin put sound effects in there and what would you call audio alterations of people's voices Mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Another thing that is just above and beyond what people normally do because it's just so much work. It's exponentially more work when you're introducing other voices and people recording in different environments and, uh, you know, people with different recorders and people with different experience of voice work and, and, and all that stuff. I and mean, it's just the reason nobody does it is because it's thankless. Why would you put yourself through that much work and suffering? But that being said, I, I think it turned out really well. There were a couple of moments in there that maybe, you know, we could have done a little better or gotten a second take on. But I think that's my own perfectionism kicking me in the butt there. And, you know, nothing is ever going to be perfect. Josh, I guess, is the final arbiter of whether we were successful or not. Hopefully he's just like, wow, that they they did things with that I, I wouldn't have thought to do. And maybe some of the things were less than what he had hoped, but hopefully other things exceeded his expectations on that. We'll have to ask Josh later, but I was impressed in listening to it. And especially because I know what goes into these productions, I was impressed that that Justin would put in the man hours that it takes for something like that. Yep, he is a good chap. A true mate of the show. Okay. <laughs> good good dog. No, we used to do this stuff all the time. And uh, since this is sort of a retrospective, there was a learning curve. And there were things that we did that didn't work so well. And we're like, oh, shoot, we will never do that again. We learned from it. And then there were mistakes that we just continued to make, which was, you know, we forgot to face the microphone the right way or we forgot to turn the (laughs) microphone on at all or we or uh, we didn't change the batteries and the recorder stopped recording absolutely and these are things that still plague us as grown-ups now but we learned and we got better and we'll talk more about that when we continue our retrospective in the next episode but yeah what you just heard 
is sort of the culmination of the things that we learned over the years. And maybe we could have done a tiny bit better, but we could have done a heck of a lot worse. So there's a very long-winded answer to your short question. Do you agree or disagree? Do you concur, Doctor? <laughs> what? What? I should have said I concurred. It does take an awful lot to put together something like this. And not only do we make the mistake of doing 55-minute full cast stories, but then we also make the mistake of doing two-hour-long post-show episodes to go with that. At one point, we had the stamina, the determination, the free time. I don't know what the the passion, the excitement was burning within us. And shoot, we did several of those a month. And truthfully, those were really good times. Those were good times, Rish Outfield. Do you remember those days? What? What, those, Marjorie? What? What? What did you those, say? Those days were good days, I tell you what. Oh, happy days, yes, with the Fonzie, yes. Yes, oh, I love the Fonzie. Fonzie Always. loves Chachi, you know. Yeah, I heard about that. I heard. Uh. Yeah, you know, those were those were really good days, and I look back on them fondly, and I, here and there, I, I think, oh, I'm going to just rekindle that, and we're just going to pick up like it was 1999. Wait, that's a different song. Pick up like it was 2000. 10 and just go like crazy again but i just can't manage to uh to bring back the magic like that you know we, we do what we can we don't get episodes out as often as i would like i was horrified to find out how long it had been since we'd gotten out an episode before our last episode which you know it was like seven or something months or more between episodes and i was just like oh my gosh we pod faded not quite all the way away, but... Well, then let's end this episode on a high note, and I can reveal to people that we have another finished story that I have completed editing, <gasps> so it won't be another seven months before you hear it. No. In fact, I, spoiler alert, read a story today and friended the author of the story on Facebook today with the intention of asking him if we could do his story on the Doonstief. So the reports of the demise of our Ooh. podcast are slightly exaggerated. <laughs> Just mildly. Only mostly dead. <laughs> There's a big difference between mostly dead and all dead. If someone's all dead, there's only one thing you can do. What's that? Go through his pockets and look for loose change. Liar! Liar! So, uh, yeah, I, I felt like I was bringing the conversation to a halt, but that's only because I'm going to have to edit this, and it would be nice if we could get it out relatively soon, close to the 10th anniversary of our show. <laughs> right. This story came about because once upon a time, in like 2014, we were talking on the show saying, boy, we wish we could do more space opera. What is space opera exactly, Big? Yeah. And then we talked about it, and I still don't know. <laughs> Had we just run a, a space opera-esque story, and we're like, we need more of this. I think that might have been the uh, impetus. And Josh sent us an email. I looked at that email yesterday, and he said, hey, guys, I've got a space opera kind of story, but it's long. It might be too long. I'm afraid it's, it's much too long. Oh, the cat's eating it. And uh, he, uh, he said, it's really long, but it's the first story in a series of stories I've written about this character. But I'll send it your way if you're mm -hmm. interested. And we said, sure. And then, yeah, 23 years later, this episode hit the airwaves. <laughs> yeah, the good thing is you can buy action figures <laughs> of Cage Gray now. They've been out for... Uh, actually, you have to get them off eBay because... They're classics oh, yes, now. They're out, they've been out but, of production. Uh, <laughs> they're, they're called vintage Cage Gray figures now. That's right. Speaking of the fact that this is a, a series of stories, there's one thing that I think we need to mention about this story. It's been such a long time that this happened. I'd almost forgotten. But I remember when he sent us this story, we read it, and we loved it, except for the ending. 
Do you remember the way it ended originally? No. It ended as if it wasn't the end. You know what I'm saying? Because it was part of a, a series. It ended in a way as though, okay, this is the very first part of a bunch of stories. Maybe a bunch of stories collected into one novel, even. And uh, now we're going to flip the page over and start reading the next story. And I remember we were like, oh, shoot. Uh, can you just adjust the ending? And I think all that he changed was like the last sentence or two where he says it's time to start taking care of my daughter. Family above all. Or is it family above everything? Now I'm having a brain fart. Anyways, I'm sorry. Family ties. Partridge family. A brand new life around the bend. So he 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 sent us a new version and he, he just wanted us to mention that uh, when it was originally published, it had a slightly different ending to it. I'm sure if you search... You can find the original story and where where to get it. And at, at this point, I'm sure you can probably buy the, the collected work in novel form. Because Josh has several books. I noticed on his website, the lead post there says, After the Apocalypse is out now. You can buy the Kindle or print edition. That's a novel, I believe. But yeah, you should definitely check that out. It's got a cool cover. <laughs> I like it. He's a real writer. Unlike <laughs> Some people. Yikes. That really hurts. I know you're not talking about you because you're not a writer at all, real or imaginary, but me, wow. <laughs> I'm not a real writer. <laughs> so I guess that brings us to the point where we would start talking, where we'd get all misty-eyed and talk about our youth and the aspirations we had when we were younger and, well, I don't know about you, but straighter. And, and so <laughs> I guess that's a cue to turn this thing off. But we are going to come back. We asked the listeners to send us questions, and we will talk a tiny bit about the 10 years that have passed. And, and get all misty-eyed. Yes, definitely. I mean, and if we don't, then we've done something wrong. But uh, before we go, I, I thought it, would, it was about time we bring back an old staple of the Steve Audio Fiction magazine and have our good friend, the Incredible Hulk, join us for a PSA. Would that be... Well, he's coming anyway. It's too you don't get a say in this one, Big. Sorry. Oh crap. And now it's time to talk about something completely different. Incredible Hulk here. Today I here to talk about importance of verified reviews on Amazon.com. Recently, there be much controversy about Amazon requiring users to have seen, purchased, or read item before being allowed to rate it on their site. You know, it very good thing to leave reviews for products and entertainment on Amazon, so others can learn and know what good and what bad. But Hulk say reviews need to be honest from registered users rather than made-up ones posted for political purposes. <sighs> you know what? F*** this. Hulk not care about this. Not when there are important things like volcano eruptions, civil unrest all over world, People being mistreated for skin color, creed, religion, sexual orientation. And Disney releases a Star Wars film nobody goes to. Do what you want. Hulk not give Moonrock-sized turd. Whoa, 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 Hulk. This Amazon thing is important. It's wrong to go on and give a bad review to something you haven't read or seen just because you don't agree with its politics. I not agree with your politics. Earth is flat. What? How is that possible? You've actually seen it from space. Oh, me going to space, just big government conspiracy theory. All shot in soundstage in middle of Nevada desert. Ah, I see what you did there. Uh, but seriously, imagine if there was somebody who didn't like Marvel Studios movies. Uh, this person not exist. Now, someone who didn't grow up with these characters might just think... Ah, uh, they too old to use internet anyway. Oh no, there are all sorts of people out there that are sick to death of superhero films... Hulk sick to death of smashing dick streams like that. 
No, no, not just DC comic fans. There are apparently whole contingencies of people who, because they don't like something, go online and downvote it just to insult its fans. Again, this not affect Hulk. Hulk not care, Lil Anklevich. Sorry, Hulk, but it could affect you. What if there was someone out there that, say, hated all green people, and so they gave negative reviews to Infinity War or some other Marvel release just out of spite? So? Hulk not like green people either. Abomination is asshole. Leader is condescending prick. Green Goblin look like Japanese kid show mascot in movie. Scar disrespectful of his father and always pee on toilet seat and not clean it up. Damn kids today. But there are a lot of great green folks. You're a green person. So is Gamora. So is Drax. Yes, but so is Impossible Man. And Fin Fang Foom. And Radioactive Man. F them. Whoa, 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 whoa. Radioactive Man is Asian. It's not cool to say that. Oh, sorry. Hulk not mean to be insensitive. No, no. Neither does Rish Outfield. The bastard. the bastard. The point is, a lot of people have been reviewing things without ever having done their homework. <laughs> Thank you. And Amazon just wants to guard against that to make things fair for everybody. Even green people? Especially green people. You know, you all right, little ankle brace. Thanks, Hulk. So... You ready to finish up the PSA? Fuck no. But me think it time to go see that movie Upgrade. Ain't no green people in that. Dude, that stars Logan Marshall Green. God damn it. All right, Hulk finish. <clears throat> Verification of users is important for sake of fairness and accuracy. Amazon not infringing on First Amendment rights when they require... You know what, Hulk? I may have been premature in interrupting you. <laughs> Your girlfriend say you premature. Uh-huh. But I agree with you. This PSA kind of blows. Your girlfriend kind of... Kind of blows, yes, yes. Uh, I'm just saying, <laughs> let's, let's go get a drink instead. Sure, little Anklesaurus. You know, that nickname is harder to say than my actual name. Logic no apply in hip-hop, man. Word. Murder was the case that they gave me. Well, that sure sucked. Getting cancer is much better than listening to you guys. Hello there, spider friends. This is Stan Lee, Excelsior. And I'm here to say a few words about cancer. Take it from me, true believers. Cancer is no laughing matter. In fact... Every single person I have... Okay. All right. Well, there you go. Thanks for showing up for uh, another episode, everybody. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you enjoyed it so much that you're willing to come back for the Misty-Eyed Part 2 of this celebration of 10 years of Dune Steve. Gosh, big. There's sure to be something that you're going to learn from it. Something super interesting. Yeah, it's, but it's funny you should mention that because... When you said Dune, Steve, it occurred to me that I, I don't know if I've ever asked you, what does Dune, Steve mean? Hmm, that's an interesting question. I think we're going to leave that as a teaser for next time. Come back to find out, everybody. Yikes, talk about J.J. Abrams there being nothing in the box. <laughs> <laughs> Good night, everybody. Thank you, Josh. See you later. Thank you, Justin. Thanks, Josh. Thanks, Thanks Grandma. Justin. Sit, Ubu. Sit. Good dog. <laughs> Roof. Thanks for listening to The Dune Did Steve. Did stop? Anything else? The Dune Steve is released under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. So you can give it to anyone, but you cannot change it or make money off it. Believe me, we know that from experience. Take two. Uh, uh, um, and, um, 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 uh, uh um, uh, um, um, uh, 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 um, uh
things like failed peace talks. Oh, that was written before. Uh, I wonder if I should change that. Yeah, but it's already gone through and been on. I'm trying to think of something else you could say. Volcano eruptions. All right. It's like volcano eruptions. Uh, uh, the, uh, um, like, uh, uh, you know, um, um uh, the, um, 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 you know, um, um that, so, that, 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 uh, t- uh, um, uh, uh, um, 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 da, Roseman, uh, um, uh, 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 I'm going home. No, I'm good. Uh, I, um, uh, you know, he's, he's, um, no jokes about rape. What? What, what was that? <laughs> <laughs> that, uh, uh, you, uh, the, um, uh, um, but me think it time to go see the, oh my gosh, this is so, so dated. Upgrade played for like seven days and then was out of theaters. <clears throat> sure, little Ankylos. Sure, little Ankylos. Sure, little Ankylos. An- Ankyl- <laughs> Ankylosaurus, I think is how you're supposed to say that. Looks like the Y is in the wrong place. Is yeah, it? I think it's Ankylosaurus. It's Ankylosaurus? I'm pretty sure, but I could be wrong. I don't know. Sure, Lil Ankylos. Sure, Lil Ankylosaur. Lil Ankylosaurus. At least we've got outtakes. <laughs> sure, Lil Ankylos. Sure, Lil Ankylos. Ankly. Ank. Ankylosaurus. Ankly- Just think Ankylosaurus. Okay. <laughs> sure, Ankylosaurus. Sure, little Ankylosaurus. You know, that nickname is harder to say than my actual name. <laughs> As evidenced by all the outtakes. <laughs> and, um, uh, for, uh, um, uh, oh, it, speaking of that, speaking of the, um, nature of this, uh, the, 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 the Speaking of the... Shit, what am I trying to say? I don't... Speaking of the fact that this is a... Uh, um, uh... Uh, yeah. Um, it would be nice if we could get it out close to the 10th anniversary of our show. This story came about... Which passed almost a month ago. Ah, uh, fuck it, who cares? <laughs> the end. Murder was Murder the case, was the that, case they that they gave, gave me. me.